Hello there, and welcome to the, I guess this is the fourth episode of our Urban Gardener podcast. We're so excited to bring with you some June tips for gardening here in um, central Oklahoma, uh, wherever you might find yourself um, giving you some tips for the urban, urban context. So uh, my name is Josh Campbell, and I'm here with my host, Julia Laughlin, and we're so excited to talk with you again today about... Um, getting started with gardening here in the summer months. So if you're joining us on YouTube, welcome. Uh, we're so glad to have you. And if you're joining us here on a podcast platform, again, welcome. We're so glad to have you. Please do take time to um, to follow us, however, however you do that through your respective apps so that we can continue to um, alert you to the episodes and things that we're providing for you. As always, we like to plug our fact sheet website. So some of the topics that we'll be talking about today, um, all of these resources will be available at facts.okstate.edu. Um, with that, I will say, Julia, we are here almost to the month of June. We're getting towards the end of May and things have been hot. Real hot. Really hot and things have been abnormally dry, I would say. Very dry. Um, and so who knows really what's ahead in terms of where things will go over the course of the summer, um, but we sure look like we're shaping up to have a really dry, really hot summer, which means um, we're gonna think about watering a little bit when it comes to our lawns, our landscapes, and our vegetable gardens. And so um, we're all in the thick, if we have a lawn area, whether it's a small lawn or a big lawn, we are all in the thick of um, starting to mow and all that comes along with having lawns. And so you can see here behind me, if you're joining us on YouTube, you can see here behind me the Bermuda grass lawn management calendar. I just like to refer people to this because it's an awesome tool, um, a fact sheet that we have that actually breaks the year down month by month, January through December, and it gives you step-by-step -step instructions in terms of what maintenance practices need to be taking place during that month of the year and uh, not only what maintenance practices, but um, how to do it. So, um, and how, how often, how much, those, those types of things. So you see here, I've highlighted the months of June, July, and August, and it breaks down everything from, um, this is a good period that you can continue to be establishing or renovating Bermuda grass lawn areas. Uh, so if you need to sod or seed, you can continue to do that into the early summer months. Um, mowing, so adjusting mowing heights, fertilization, watering, all of those things are covered here. And so I uh, won't spend a lot of time belaboring that today, but if you have a lawn that you keep up and you're one of the more do-it-yourself types, this fact sheet is a super great resource for I you. think it's one of the best ones that has come out of Oklahoma State University as far as the ones that pertain to horticulture mm -hmm. and urban uh, because it's so easy to use. Very user-friendly, so much information packed in a one-pager, so it's front and back, not a lot of reading, um, just very user-friendly uh, tables to help you figure out the information that you need. And it's and it's perfectly um, organized so to where when you switch, make your switch to the next month too, you know that you're gonna raise your height of your mower or whatever it is that you need to do. I love it. I think that there, you can read and read and read, but sometimes you just need to see um, something in a digestible form, yeah. I guess, and that's what this, this uh, chart is. So. Definitely a good quick reference. Yes. Um, so we'll we'll move on now to the meat of what we hope to talk about today, and um, that is some of the potential pest concerns that you may encounter in a uh, in a landscape setting. So Julia, we get people to call us or come into the office all the time with questions about these creepy things that they're seeing yeah, in their right. trees or hanging right. from from a, a shrub. Tell us a little bit about these. Well, um, so what what I seen right now, I just noticed it when um, I noticed it a couple of days ago. Here it is. What is it? The twentieth of you know, kind of on the first of, of June, but the uh, third week in May, and I'm seeing already the signs of the first um, fall wetworm generation. Mm -hmm. At first, when I saw them, they were in. Um, a shrub and boxwood and it's hard for me to explain how I saw them there in the corner of a boxwood and I thought well that's the tent caterpillar which we see in April still hanging around and then when I was in another part of my landscape I saw it on a tree and realized it really was the first generation of it so something is going right for them the temperature is exactly right of course the fall webworm, webworm Josh is the one that 
you sometimes hear people call it a bagworm mm -hmm. because it makes that web in the tree. Um, it looks like a spider web. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think um, if you, it is a, it is a web. It's, it's a web spun by a, a worm instead of a spider. But um, in just a second, we'll talk about the bagworm, which play, makes the little bag that hangs in the tree. When I see web worms, I always think of like Halloween. Um, yes. That, that's the, like stuff yeah. that you, you put up for, for Halloween in yeah. trees or things. And, and it can, looks it looks exactly like if that. If you have them real bad, you could tell people you decorated for yeah. Halloween in the <laughs> fall. So what's weird about them is they're going to have a generation in generally in late May, early June. But I mean, they're here, so we're seeing them right mm -hmm. now. And then, depending on how good that generation goes, as far as mating and egg laying and everything, then there may or may not be an explosion of them in their second generation, which starts in August, and then is everywhere in fall. So we just don't know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's got to do with everything going right for them, but the fact that they're already out and going strong is a sign to me that we wanna start taking a broomstick, the end of a broomstick, or the broom end of a broomstick, and, uh, of a broom, I'm sorry, and open up that um, uh, web so that if you give it open, the birds will move in and eat those worms that are in there. You could also use a biological product, the one Bacillus thuringiensis, which is big words for uh, a product that we usually just call BT for short. And BT products um, are like Dipel or Thuricide, and you can um, spray that. It's very, very safe to use. You just spray it on the tissue around that web, and the worms, as they're eating, and they eat in the tissue right there around mm -hmm. the web, because they keep opening their web bigger and bigger to eat the tissue, then they'll get a stomach ache and die. But yet, a bird could come along and eat that worm, and it won't hurt them. Yeah, that's great. Um, so it's very, very safe. It only kills that particular insect or, or worms, uh, Lepidopter worms. Now, obviously, the, the BT control is gonna be an effective way to actually kill the worms. You mentioned opening up the web with a, a broom handle yeah. or a shovel or something. Yeah. How effective in your experience is like a heavy uh, uh, stream of water sprayed into them? That would those be great, problems? but you've got to have a lot of pressure. Because okay. I've tried it with just, you know, a pressure, you know, those little um, um, ones, pressure wand that goes on the end of the hose. And if it, unless it's extremely high, uh, pressure that doesn't do a whole lot of good. When they come to your house and they spray for them, they use high pressure sprayers that okay. knock them open and get the chemical on there. But I think if you were spraying at home, you just want to spray the tissue around the web, open up the web, web and they'll eat those leaves that are right there anyway as they move. So, okay. um, But try it, look for BT. There's no reason to use any other product. This one's so safe to the environment. And it can also be used for the bagworms, which are right. And, yeah. and there's a lot of confusion between the two. So tell us yeah. a little bit about bagworms and how they differ. So the are, way to remember the lab, the webworm is the spooky Halloween thing we were just talking about. It really does look like you sprayed, you know, you sprayed those webs that you can spray on Halloween. Where the bagworm makes that, you know, one and a half to two inch bag that hangs in your tree. A lot of times they hang in your. Um, uh, I see them in junipers a lot, but you can see them on, you know, sometimes they'll get on perennial plants. Yeah, I've seen yeah. them in all sorts. My, uh, my bald cypress had some yeah. not uh, not too long ago, yep. or last, last season for yeah. sure, and I think I saw some earlier this and, year. And you know what, what's creepy? I know you, you know this, Josh, but they're taking pieces of whatever they're eating and they're webbing it into that mm -hmm. little bag that they make. So if you look at the little bag, it's made out of whatever it was they're so eating. They web that, they, they weave that. So they, they, they hatch out in, right now, in late May or the very first of June. So okay. sometimes, you know, sometimes, it, you know, they'll, it depends, it's weather dependent, but we're having a warm mm -hmm. early summer or late spring. So they'll hatch out, they'll start feeding, and as they feed, they'll make that little bag around themselves. They make stay down inside of the bag. And then the female is in one bag and the male is in the other bag and they continue to eat till they mature. The male has wings and he flies over to the female bag and then she lays, they mate and she lays eggs in that bag. So when you're looking at those bags hanging on your bald mm -hmm. cypress or whatever, um, every other bag in theory could have 60 or 80 eggs in it. Wow, that's so interesting. I know, and then they hatch out this time of the year. So the thing to do is if you have them on a landscape tree or shrub, is to spray the BT, like we mentioned before, the Bacillus thuringiensis, or BT, um, where you have them on your t on the tissue, and then when the babies hatch out and start feeding, they'll get sick at their stomach and they'll die, and it wow. works works really, really good, and it's very safe. My my wife um, jokingly remembers as a, as a kid, her grandfather, they lived on 
on an acreage and he always struggled with backwards and he would pay the grandkids and make a competition to go pull them off and she didn't know what they were as a kid yeah. um, but she'd go fill a bucket with them and, and he'd pay them i don't know a certain you know penny or, nickel or something nickel yeah, or per, per bagworm or, yeah. or something and she would fill buckets full and then later in life when she realized what they were she was so grossed out by <laughs> well i remember taking them off one time for a workshop where i was teaching people and i came back and they were gone and they had crawled off the oh, table no. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? But anyway, both of those can be controlled, and right now is the time, but what you want to do is be on the lookout and know where you are. And look into this organic product, BT. The other thing that you could be doing right now, Josh, is um, cleaning up in the garden after you get everything planted, and we should talk a minute about mulching. Mm -hmm. um, you know, get that mulch down and make everything, makes everything look completely done. That's what I'm going to do this weekend is start mulching. Especially with as warm as we've been, you know, sometimes um, our, like we said earlier, our springs can be a little bit wetter and even cooler. We've been especially uh, dry and had, I would say, above normal temperatures. And so really getting mulched down when we start getting into hot temperatures helps keep that, that soil right around the crown of the plants, uh, that, that heat um, regulated so that you don't have huge flux in temperature right. and, uh, and, and really helps hold moisture that we need. So there's a lot of benefits to adding mulch. Right yeah, now. and we want to use the organic mulch whenever we can. Um, you're the compost guy, but I mean, compost is the best mulch. Whether you buy it bagged, mm -hmm. you buy it, make your own, or you bring it from a, you know, from a materials company, buy the truck load or the big bag load, um, because it's going to feed your soil and just continue to make your soil better, isn't it? Yeah, it's great. It's great. I definitely encourage, um, especially for those that are trying to uh, practice. Um, maybe lower input gardening or you have an interest in organic gardening it's a great way to to um, add some mulch add a, a, a low uh, slow feeding form of, of nutrients and, um, and microorganisms and then all of the macro microorganisms yeah. that that really thrive in a in a place with rich high organic material soil which compost provides you well sometimes what um, amazes me where I mulch with compost and I go back in the in the next season or planting and there's earthworms there and I was like this was not good soil mm -hmm. and now you put the compost in and then there's yeah. rich it's like feel the dreams right you build it and yeah come. and they will come they come out of nowhere <laughs> <laughs> yeah but so we're gonna get the mulch on um get the irrigation underneath the mulch if you're gonna do that in your garden right so get your irrigation down your drip hoses your soaker hoses and mulch on top use something organic if you can to feed the soil and then um I mentioned a, a really good tip for June too is to remember to deadhead your flowers in the garden. Um, one of the main ones that has to be deadheaded always is one of the most popular garden flowers of all time around the world, and that's the geranium. The geraniums. Yeah, they just will quit. If you don't pop those flowers off of there, they'll quit making flowers. Um, a lot of other things need to be deadheaded too. Zinnias will respond real well. Um, uh, the salvias, the larkspur. A lot of people don't think to deadhead some of the modern flowers because they'll just keep blooming, mm -hmm. but you can get those dead flowers heads off and they'll generally, um, they'll, they, they'll continue to, to bloom. So some of the perennials that like to be deadheaded include all the daisies, um, the salvias I just mentioned, garden floxes, hollyhocks, um, yarrows, um, coreopsis, I'm skipping some purple comfy. That's a good one too. Mm -hmm. Think of anything that has a daisy head where the head fades like a like a comfy or a rudbeckia. If you'll get those heads cut off cuz they're, you know, trying to bloom like crazy mm -hmm. right now, but deadhead them and then they'll um they'll bloom again and come back. So you just cut those off and, and uh, encourage them so to So many great them out. great flowers that you can you can grow this time of year and Oh, I know, and it's just, so pretty. Yeah, I just get excited yeah. this time of year as things I are really too. starting to come on. And, and, yeah, you know what excites me this much, so, so much still after doing this for a lot of years is just a, a perennial popping up and you're like, oh, you're back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even, uh, you know, sometimes, time, yeah. yeah, or maybe you didn't think yeah. that plant was going to come back. Yeah. And it's just, it's exciting. I, I, hostas always do that to me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I forgot oh, gosh. how you know, pretty you, they are. Hostas are such bulletproof plants, yeah. They are, and, and they just pop out of nowhere and you're like, I forgot you were there. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, get your mulch on, do some deadheading on those early blooming things. And then we have kind of an important tip for this month, I think, and that's to water water the birds. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I, I mention this a lot because it's not anything anyone 
does on purpose is in urban gardening, they forget that all those beneficial insects mm -hmm. that come to the garden, not to mention the birds that visit your bird feeders, need water. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great point. Well, and um, where do they go in urban settings if right. there's not, you know, in the country they know where the ponds are and they know, um, you know what I mean. They're you mm -hmm. know livestock ponds. They can find water, but um, I always think about this when I'm talking to people about doing pollinator gardens, because I'm like, you bring all those pollinators, but you really need to think about a water source. Yeah, you've got to create a full ecosystem and habitat that they are going to thrive in. Yeah, stay and yeah. Spend time on your property. So as you, yeah, as you garden this this early summer going into June, think about you can do. I always try to think of ways to do economically economical things because we don't all have a lot right now. Nobody has extra money. Mm -hmm. Everything is so expensive right now, but you can just go to the dollar store and buy a heavy pot, turn it upside down, and put a heavy plate or or um, a saucer from the dollar store for you know plant saucer, mm -hmm. and then put that on there. If it's not heavy enough, put a, put a rock and a big rock in it, and put some water, and you have a butterfly bath. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a butterfly bath, and they will they'll land on that rock and they'll get their you know little mm -hmm. um, all the moisture that and little bodies need. I think. With that, what I've done this in the past, and what I'll do is I'll have it somewhere in the landscape where I'm typically watering by hand, like by with a garden hose or something, yeah. so that every time I go over to that area, I can just spray new fresh water over that, and it's disturbing that site, so we're not having st static water that's going to be a breeding ground for mosquitoes or that's something right. like that. Yeah. But but it's still going to collect some some of the water when I water the plants, so that there's fresh water for. Yeah. Um, or yep. the beneficial insects that and we if want you, in our If gardens. you are worried about mosquitoes, get yourself a mosquito dunkers. Mm -hmm. They're sold everywhere. Um, you can break a little piece, put gloves on it, it mm -hmm. says to put gloves on it. Break a little piece off and put it in your bird feeder. It tells you how to do it on the instructions. But um, fresh water is the big secret though, Josh, really is just keep mm -hmm. freshening it. They lay their, mosquito lay their egg, mosquitoes lay their eggs in stagnant water. So um, really it's a, it's a happy time to be outside, but remember to water yeah. your friends. That's yeah, a really good time. Um, and also, you know, if you're a gardener, you've probably already got most of your plants in the ground. Uh, but uh, we don't have a slide on this, but one thing that came to mind was this uh, the guidebook that we have, which is the uh, Guide to Water Efficient Landscapes for it's Oklahoma. A good one, yeah. Really great guide. If you go to that facts.okstate.edu website that we always talk about, type in um, water saving landscapes or guide to water efficient plants, key, some keyword like that. Uh, it will pop up and it is a just an awesome full color nice photos um, that, that walk you through a lot of great plants perennials annuals um, that are gonna trees and shrubs I think are even included in there that are going to be great for a central Oklahoma landscape and really some we think about beauty and um, pollinator plants there's a lot of those packed in there as well and so if you're looking for some inspiration for maybe some uh, future plants to put in the landscape or you've got some last minute gardening you want to get done you want to go see if you can find some stuff at, a, at the garden center to put in um, that would be a great starting point for you when you're looking for some plants yeah I love that that's a really good publication so uh, with that Julia any any last minute uh, tips as we think about the month of June that people all, should be put considering? on your hat and your sunscreen hat and sunscreen. it's gonna be a hot June I think Very I important. really do I, mean, I shouldn't say that, but that's the rumor on the streets in Oklahoma right now is we're going to have a hot summer, but you just never know. You never know. Yeah. So before we sign off, tell us a little bit about some of the urban gardening adventures you're going to have in Europe. Oh, I don't, I, well, I'll be in London. Okay. Uh, so in London, I'm on my way to London, and um, the what's weird about London is they have allotments. You know this, you've been there. Yeah, I, have, I have not been there, but I know so, about allotments. So I follow allotments, people on Instagram yeah, allotments, allotments yeah. So look into this if you want to uh, Google something interesting about this. But so what would happen was the the land, the, the, the wealthy people in London in the uh, 18th and 19th century too, they, um, and into the 20th, they would own the tenant buildings, right? Mm -hmm. But you could get an allotment, which would be a piece of ground where you can have a garden. Um, where you can have a little tiny garden in London, um, but they were very competitive. So you, you know, you may have an allotment that was passed down from family to family to family, mm -hmm. and we take that for granted when we have these big giant yards, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And they, even you know, even in our urban context, at least here in Oklahoma, um, 
and in many places around the country, our urban settings still have more yard than a lot of places around the, oh, the world. Oh yeah, so yeah. much. We have so we just don't realize it when we when we're used to it. You know, mm -hmm. big urban lawns or people mow an acre of grass in mm -hmm. sometimes, and mm -hmm. to to the people in big cities in Europe, that just doesn't they can't even get their arms around that. You mm -hmm. know, but um, yeah, there's fun in urban gardening everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Julia will be jet setting this this summer doing some garden tours. So I had to had to throw that plug out there because I'll be jealous the entire time she's. In well, you go next time. Okay, <laughs> next time. With that, we we thank you so much for uh, continuing to stick with us and listen, and we will continue to bring unique and interesting content to you in the future. We hope to even do some guest interviews with people that are gardening and doing some unique things in the urban setting here. Um, and so do stick with us. Um, like us or follow us or whatever it is that you do on the platforms that you're engaging with this and um, we will see you next time.